The Swift Programming Language, The Basics, Text Copyright 2022 by Apple, and made available under the Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 International License. Swift is a new programming language for iOS, macOS, watchOS, and tvOS app development. Nonetheless, many parts of Swift will be familiar from your experience of developing in C and Objective-C. Swift provides its own versions of all fundamental C and Objective-C types, including int for integers, double and float for floating point values, bool for boolean values, and string for textual data. Swift also provides powerful versions of three primary collection types, array, set, and dictionary, as described in collection types. Like C, Swift uses variables to store and refer to values by an identifying name. Swift also makes extensive use of variables whose values cannot be changed. These are known as constants and are much more powerful than constants in C. Constants are used throughout Swift to make code safer and clearer in intent when you work with values that do not need to change. In addition to familiar types, Swift introduces advanced types not found in Objective-C, such as tuples. Tuples enable you to create and pass around groupings of values. You can use a tuple to return multiple values from a function as a single compound value. Swift also introduces optional types, which handle the absence of a value. Optionals say either there is a value and it equals x, or there is not a value at all. Using optionals is similar to using nil with pointers in Objective-C, but they work for any type, not just classes. Not only are optionals safer and more expressive than nil pointers in Objective-C, they are at the heart of many of Swift's most powerful features. Swift is a type-safe language, which means the language helps you to be clear about the types of values your code can work with. If part of your code requires a string, type safety prevents you from passing it an int by mistake. Likewise, type safety prevents you from accidentally passing an optional string to a piece of code that requires a non-optional string. Type safety helps you catch and fix errors as early as possible in the development process. Constants and variables associate a name such as maximum number of login attempts or welcome message with the value of a particular type, such as the number 10 or the string hello. The value of a constant cannot be changed once it is set, whereas a variable can be set to a different value in the future. Declaring constants and variables. Constants and variables must be declared before they are used. You declare constants with the let keyword and variables with the var keyword. Here's an example of how constants and variables can be used to track the number of login attempts a user has made. This code can be read as declare a new constant called maximum number of login attempts and give it a value of 10. Then declare a new variable called current login attempt and give it an initial value of zero. In this example, the maximum number of allowed login attempts is declared as a constant because the maximum value never changes. The current login attempt counter is declared as a variable because this value must be incremented after each failed login attempt. You can declare multiple constants or multiple variables on a single line separated by commas. Note, if a stored value in your code will not change, always declare it as a constant with the let keyword. Use variables only for storing values that need to be able to change. Type annotations. You can provide a type annotation when you declare a constant or variable to be clear about what kind of values the constant or variable can store. Write a type annotation by placing a colon after the constant or variable name, followed by a space, followed by the name of the type to use. This example provides a type annotation for a variable called welcome message to indicate that the variable can store string values. The colon in the declaration means of type. So the code above can be read as declare a variable called welcome message that is of type string. The phrase of type string means can store any string value. Think of it as meaning the type of thing or the kind of thing that can be stored. The welcome message variable can now be set to any string value without error. You can define multiple related variables of the same type on a single line separated by commas with a single type annotation after the final variable name. Note, 
It is rare that you need to write type annotations in practice. If you provide an initial value for a constant or variable at the point that it is defined, Swift can almost always infer the type to be used for that constant or variable as described in type safety and type inference. In the welcome message above, no initial value is provided, and so the type of welcome message variable is specified with a type annotation rather than being inferred from an initial value. Naming constants and variables. Constants and variable names can contain almost any character, including Unicode characters. Constant and variable names cannot contain white space characters, mathematical symbols, arrows, private use Unicode sc scalar values, or line and box drawing characters. Nor can they begin with a number, although numbers may be included elsewhere within the name. Once you have declared a constant or variable of a certain type, you cannot declare it again with the same name or change it to store values of a different type, nor can you change a constant into a variable or a variable into a constant. Note, if you need to give a constant or variable the same name as a reserved Swift keyword, surround the keyword with backticks when using it as a name. However, avoid using keywords as names unless you have absolutely no choice. You can change the value of an existing variable to another value of a compatible type. In this example, the value of friendly welcome is changed from hello to bonjour. Unlike a variable, the value of a constant cannot be changed after it is set. Attempting to do so is reported as an error when your code is compiled. Printing constants and variables. You can print the current value of a constant or variable with the print separator terminator function. The print separator terminator function is a global function that prints one or more values to an appropriate output. In Xcode, for example, the print separator terminator function prints its output in Xcode's console pane. The separator and terminator parameters have default values, so you can omit them when you call this function. By default, the function terminates the line it prints by adding a line break. To print a value without a line break after it, pass an empty string as the terminator. For example, print some value terminator. For information about parameters with default values, see default parameter values. Swift uses string interpolation to include the name of a constant or variable as a placeholder in a longer string and to prompt Swift to replace it with the current value of that constant or variable. Wrap the name in parentheses and escape it with the backslash before the opening parenthesis. Note, all options you can use with string interpolation are described in string interpolation. Comments. Use comments to include non-executable text in your code as a note or reminder to yourself. Comments are ignored by the Swift compiler when your code is compiled. Comments in Swift are very similar to comments in C. Single line comments begin with two forward slashes. Multi-line comments start with a forward slash followed by an asterisk and end with an asterisk followed by a forward slash. Unlike multi-line comments in C, multi-line comments in Swift can be nested inside other multi-line comments. You write nested comments by starting a multi-line comment block and then starting a second multi-line comment within the first block. The second block is then closed, followed by the first block. Nested multi-line comments enable you to comment out large blocks of code quickly and easily, even if the code already contains multi-line comments. Semicolons. Unlike many other languages, Swift does not require you to write a semicolon after each statement in your code, although you can do so if you wish. However, semicolons are required if you want to write multiple separate statements on a single line. Integers. Integers are whole numbers with no fractional component, such as 42 and negative 23. Integers are either signed, positive, zero, or negative, or unsigned, positive, or zero. Swift provides signed and unsigned integers in the 8, 16, 32, and 64-bit forms. These integers allow a naming convention similar to C in that 8-bit unsigned integer is of type uint8, and a 32-bit signed integer is of type int32. Like all types in Swift, these integer types have capitalized names. Integer bounds. You can access the minimum and maximum values of each integer type with its min and max properties. 
The values of these properties are of the appropriate size number type, such as uint8 in the example above, and can therefore be used in expressions alongside other values of the same type. Int. In most cases, you do not need to pick a specific size of integer to use in your code. Swift provides an additional integer type, int, which has the same size as the current platform's native word size. On a 32-bit platform, int is the same size as int32. On a 64-bit platform, int is the same size as int64. Unless you need to work with a specific size of integer, always use int for integer values in your code. This aids code consistency and interoperability. Even on 32-bit platforms, int can store any value between negative 2.1 billion and positive 2.1 billion and is large enough for many integer ranges. uint. Swift also provides an unsigned integer type, uint, which has the same size as the current platform's native word size. On a 32-bit platform, uint is the same size as uint32. On a 64-bit platform, uint is the same size as uint64. Note, use uint only when you specifically need an unsigned integer type with the same size as the platform's native word size. If this is not the case, int is preferred even when the values to be stored are known to be non-negative. A consistent use of int for integer values aids code interoperability, avoids the need to convert between different number types, and matches integer type inference as described in type safety and type inference. Floating point numbers. Floating point numbers are numbers with a fractional component, such as 3.14159, 0 0.1, or negative 273.15. Floating point types can represent a much wider range of values than integer types, and can store numbers that are much larger or smaller than can be stored in an int. Swift provides two signed floating point number types. Double represents a 64-bit floating point number. Float represents a 32-bit floating point number. Note, double has a precision of at least 15 decimal digits, whereas the precision of float can be as little as six decimal digits. The appropriate floating point type to use depends on the nature and range of values you need to work with in your code. In situations where either type would be appropriate, double is preferred. Type safety and type inference. Swift is a type safe language. A type safe language encourages you to be clear about the types of values your code can work with. If part of your code requires a string, you cannot pass it an int by mistake. Because Swift is type safe, it performs type checks when compiling your code and flags any mismatched types as errors. This enables you to catch and fix errors as early as possible in the development process. Type checking helps you avoid errors when you're working with different types of values. However, this does not mean that you have to specify the type of every constant and variable that you declare. If you do not specify the type of value you need, Swift uses type inference to work out the appropriate type. Type inference enables a compiler to deduce the type of a particular expression automatically when it compiles your code simply by examining the values you provide. Because of type inference, Swift requires far fewer type declarations than languages such as C or Objective-C. Constants and variables are still explicitly typed, but much of the work of specifying their type is done for you. Type inference is particularly useful when you declare a constant or variable with an initial value. This is often done by assigning a literal value, or literal, to the constant or variable at the point that you declare it. A literal value is a value that appears directly in your source code, such as 42 and 3.14159. For example, if you assign a literal value of 42 to a new constant without specifying what type it is, Swift infers that you want the constant to be an int because you have initialized it with a number that looks like an integer. Likewise, if you don't specify the type for a floating point literal, Swift infers that you want to create a double. Swift always chooses double rather than float when inferring the type of floating point numbers. If you combine integer and floating point literals in an expression, a type of double will be inferred from the context. The literal value of three has no explicit type in and of itself, 
and so an appropriate output type of double is inferred from the presence of a floating point literal as part of the addition. Numeric literals. Integer literals can be written as a decimal number with no prefix, a binary number with a 0b prefix, an octal number with a 0o prefix, a hexadecimal number with a 0x prefix. All of these integer literals have a decimal value of 17. Floating point literals can be decimal with no prefix or hexadecimal with a 0x prefix. They must always have a number or hexadecimal number on both sides of the decimal point. Decimal floats can also have an optional exponent indicated by an uppercase or lowercase e. Hexadecimal floats must have an exponent indicated by an uppercase or lowercase p. For decimal numbers with an exponent, the base number is multiplied by 10 to the exponent. 1.25e2 means 1.25 times 10 to the second power, or 125.0. 1.25e negative 2 means 1.25 times 10 to the negative second power, or 0 0.0125. For hexadecimal numbers with an exponent of exp, the base number is multiplied by 2 to the exponent. 0xfp2 means 15 times 2 squared, or 60. 0xfp negative 2 means 15 times 2 to the negative second power, or 3.75. All of these floating point literals have a decimal value of 12.1875. Numeric literals can contain extra formatting to make them easier to read. Both integers and floats can be padded with extra zeros and can contain underscores to help with readability. Neither type of formatting affects the underlying value of the literal. Numeric type conversion. Use the int type for all general purpose integer constants and variables in your code, even if they are known to be non-negative. Using the default integer type in everyday situations means that integer constants and variables are immediately interoperable in your code and will match the inferred type for integer literal values. Use other integer types only when they're specifically needed for the task at hand because of explicitly sized data from an external source or for performance, memory usage, or other necessary optimization. Using explicitly sized types in these situations helps to catch any accidental value overflows and implicitly documents the nature of the data being used. Integer conversion. The range of numbers that can be stored in an integer constant or variable is different for each numeric type. An int 8 constant or variable can store numbers between negative 128 and 127, whereas a uint 8 constant or variable can store numbers between 0 and 255. A number that will not fit into a constant or variable of a sized integer type is reported as an error when your code is compiled. Because each numeric type can store a different range of values, you must opt into numeric type conversion on a case-by-case -case basis. This opt-in approach prevents hidden conversion errors and helps make type conversion intentions explicit in your code. To convert one specific number type to another, you initialize a new number of the desired type with the existing value. In the example below, the constant 2000 is of type uint16, whereas the constant 1 is of type uint8. They can't be added together directly because they are not of the same type. Instead, this example calls uint16 1 to create a new uint16 initialized with the value of 1 and uses this value in place of the original. Because both sides of the addition are now type uint16, the addition is allowed. The output constant 2001 is inferred to be of type uint16 because it is the sum of two uint16 values. Some type of initial value is the default way to call the initializer of a Swift type and pass in an initial value. Behind the scenes, uint16 has an initializer that accepts a uint8 value, and so this initializer is used to make a new uint16 from an existing uint8. You cannot pass in any type here, however. It has to be a type for which uint16 provides an initializer. Extending existing types to provide initializers that accept new types including your own type definitions, is covered in extensions. Integer and floating point conversion. Conversions between integer and floating point numeric types must be made explicit. Here, 
the value of the constant 3 is used to create a new value of type double so that both sides of the addition are of the same type. Without this conversion in place, the addition would not be allowed. Floating point to integer conversion must also be made explicit. An integer type can be initialized with a double or float value. Floating point values are always truncated when used to initialize a new integer value in this way. This means that 4.75 becomes 4 and negative 3.9 becomes negative 3. Note, the rules for combining numeric constants and variables are different from the rules for numeric literals. The literal value 3 can be added directly to the literal value 0 0.14159 because number literals don't have an explicit type in and of themselves. Their type is inferred only at the point that they are evaluated by the compiler. Type aliases define an alternative name for an existing type. You define type aliases with the type alias keyword. Type aliases are useful when you want to refer to an existing type by a name that is contextually more appropriate, such as when working with data from a specific size from an external source. Once you define a type alias, you can use the alias anywhere you might use the original name. Here, audio sample is defined as an alias for uint16. Because it is an alias, the call to audiosample.min actually calls uint16.min, which provides an initial value of 0 for the max amplitude found variable. Booleans. Swift has a basic Boolean type called bool. Boolean values are referred to as logical because they can only ever be true or false. Swift provides two constant Boolean values, true and false. The types of oranges are orange and turnips are delicious, have been inferred as bool from the fact that they were initialized with Boolean literal values. As with int and double above, you do not need to declare constants or variables as bool if you set them to true or false as soon as you create them. Type inference helps make Swift code more concise and readable when it initializes constants or variables with other values whose type is already known. Boolean values are particularly useful when you work with conditional statements, such as the if statement. Conditional statements, such as the if statement, are covered in more detail in control flow. Swift's type safety prevents non-Boolean values from being substituted for bool. This example reports a compile time error. However, this alternative example is valid. The result of the i equals 1 comparison is of type bool, and so the second example passes the type check. Comparisons like i equal equal 1 are discussed in basic operations. As with other examples of type safety and Swift, this approach avoids accidental errors and ensures that the intention of a particular section of code is always clear. Tuples group multiple values into a single compound value. The values within a tuple can be of any type and do not have to be of the same type as each other. In this example, 404 not found is a tuple that describes an HTTP status code. An HTTP status code is a special value returned by a web server whenever you request a web page. A status code of 404 not found is returned if you request a web page that does not exist. The 404 not found tuple groups together an int and a string to give the HTTP status code two separate values, a number and a human readable description. It can be described as a tuple of type int comma string. You can create tuples from any permutation of types and they can contain as many different types as you like. There is nothing stopping you from having a tuple of type int 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 or string bool or indeed any other permutation you require. You can decompose a tuple's contents into separate constants or variables, which you then access as usual. If you only need some of the tuple's values, ignore parts of the tuple with an underscore when you decompose the tuple. Alternatively, access the individual element values in a tuple using index numbers starting at zero. You can name the individual elements in a tuple when the tuple is defined. If you name the elements in the tuple, you can use the element names to access the values of those elements. 
Tuples are particularly useful as the return values of functions. A function that tries to retrieve a web page might return the int string tuple type to describe the success or failure of the page retrieval. By returning a tuple with two distinct values, each of a different type, the function provides more useful information about its outcome than if it could only return a single value of a single type. For more information, see functions with multiple return values. Note, tuples are useful for simple groups of related values. They are not suited to the creation of complex data structures. If your data structure is likely to be more complex, model it as a class or structure rather than as a tuple. For more information, see structures and classes. Optionals. You use optionals in situations where a value may be absent. An optional represents two possibilities. Either there is a value and you can unwrap the optional to access that value, or there is not a value at all. Note, the concept of optionals does not exist in C or Objective-C. The nearest thing in Objective-C is the ability to return nil from a method that would otherwise return an object, with nil meaning the absence of a valid object. However, this only works for objects. It does not work for structures, basic C types, or enumeration values. For these types, Objective-C methods typically return a special value, such as ns not found, to indicate the absence of a value. This approach assumes that the method's caller knows there is a special value to test against and remembers to check for it. Swift's optionals let you indicate the absence of a value for any type at all without a need for special constants. Here is an example of how optionals can be used to cope with the absence of a value. Swift's int type has an initializer which tries to convert a string value into an int value. However, not every string can be converted into an integer. The string 123 can be converted into the numeric value 123, but the string hello world does not have an obvious numeric value to convert to. The example uses the initializer to try to convert a string into an int. Because the initializer might fail, it returns an optional int rather than an int. An optional int is written as int question mark, not int. The question mark indicates that the value it contains is optional, meaning that it might contain some int value or it might contain no value at all. It cannot contain anything else, such as a bool value or a string value. It is either an int or it is nothing at all. Nil. You set an optional variable to a valueless state by assigning it the special value nil. Note, you cannot use nil with non-optional constants and variables. If a constant or variable in your code needs to work with the absence of a value under certain conditions, always declare it as an optional value of the appropriate type. If you define an optional variable without providing a default value, the variable is automatically set to nil for you. Note, Swift's nil is not the same as nil in Objective-C. In Objective-C, nil is a pointer to a non-existent object. In Swift, nil is not a pointer. It is the absence of a value of a certain type. Optionals of any type can be set to nil, not just object types. If statements and forced unwrapping. You can use an if statement to find out whether an optional contains a value by comparing the optional against nil. You perform this comparison with the equal to operator or the not equal to operator. If an optional has a value, it is considered to be not equal to nil. Once you are sure that the optional does contain a value, you can access its underlying value by adding an exclamation point to the end of the optional's name. The exclamation point effectively says, I know that this optional definitely has a value. Please use it. This is known as forced unwrapping of the optional's value. For more about the if statement, see control flow. Note, trying to use an exclamation mark to access a non-existent optional value triggers a runtime error. Always make sure that an optional contains a non-nil value before using the exclamation mark to force unwrap its value. You use optional binding to find out whether an optional contains a value, and if so, to make that value available as a temporary constant or variable. Optional binding can be used with if and while statements to check for a value inside an optional and to extract that value into a constant or variable as part of a single action. If and while statements are described in more detail in control flow.
write an optional binding for an if statement as follows. If let constant name equals some optional and then statements. You can rewrite the possible number example from the optional section to use the optional binding rather than forced unwrapping. This code can be read as, if the optional int returns by int possible number contains a value, set a new constant called actual number to the value contained in the optional. If the conversion is successful, the actual number constant becomes available for use within the first branch of the if statement. It has already been initialized with the value contained within the optional, and so you don't use the exclamation mark suffix to access its value. In this example, actual number is simply used to print the result of the conversion. You can use both constants and variables with optional binding. If you wanted to manipulate the value of actual number within the first branch of the if statement, you could write if var actual number instead, and the value contained within the optional would be made available as a variable rather than a constant. You can include as many optional bindings and Boolean conditions in a single if statement as you need to, separated by commas. If any of the values in the optional bindings are nil, or any Boolean condition evaluates to false, the whole if statement's condition is considered to be false. The following if statements are equivalent. Note, constants and variables created with optional binding in an if statement are available only within the body of the if statement. In contrast, the constants and variables created with a guard statement are available in the lines of code that follow the guard statement, as described in early exit. Implicitly unwrapped optionals. As described above, optionals indicate that a constant or variable is allowed to have no value. Optionals can be checked with an if statement to see if a value exists and can be conditionally unwrapped with optional binding to access the optionals value if it does exist. Sometimes, it is clear from a program structure that an optional will always have a value after that value is first set. In these cases, it is useful to remove the need to check and unwrap the optional's value every time it is accessed, because it can be safely assumed to have a value all of the time. These kinds of optionals are defined as implicitly unwrapped optionals. You write an implicitly unwrapped optional by placing an exclamation point at rather than a question mark after the type that you want to make optional. Rather than placing an exclamation point after the optional's name when you use it, you place an exclamation point after the optional's type when you declare it. Implicitly unwrapped optionals are useful when an optional's value is confirmed to exist immediately after the optional is first defined and can definitely be assumed to exist at every point thereafter. The primary use of implicitly unwrapped optionals in Swift is during class initialization as described in unowned references and implicitly unwrapped optional properties. An implicitly unwrapped optional is a normal optional behind the scenes, but can also be used like a non-optional value without the need to unwrap the optional value each time it is accessed. The following example shows the difference in behavior between an optional string and an implicitly unwrapped optional string when accessing the wrapped value as an explicit string. You can think of an implicitly unwrapped optional as giving permission for the optional to be force unwrapped if needed. When you use an implicitly unwrapped optional value, Swift first tries to use it as an ordinary optional value. If it cannot be used as an optional, Swift force unwraps the value. In the code, the optional value assumed string is force unwrapped before assigning its value to implicit string because implicit string has an explicit non-optional type of string. In the code below, optional string does not have an explicit type, so it is an ordinary optional. If an implicitly unwrapped optional is nil and you try to access its wrapped value, you will trigger a runtime error. The result is exactly the same as if you place an exclamation point after a normal optional that does not contain a value. You can check whether an implicitly unwrapped optional is nil the same way you check a normal optional. You can also use an implicitly unwrapped optional with optional binding to check and unwrap its value in a single statement. Note, do not use an implicitly unwrapped optional when there is a possibility of a variable becoming nil at a later point. Always use a normal optional type if you need to check for a nil value during the lifetime of a variable. Error handling. 
You use error handling to respond to error conditions your program may encounter during execution. In contrast to optionals, which can use the presence or absence of a value to communicate success or failure of a function, error handling allows you to determine the underlying cause of failure and, if necessary, propagate the error to another part of your program. When a function encounters an error condition, it throws an error. That function's caller can then catch the error and respond appropriately. A function indicates that it can throw an error by including the throws keyword in its declaration. When you call a function that can throw an error, you prepend the try keyword to the expression. Swift automatically propagates errors out of their current code until they are handled by a catch clause. A do statement creates a new containing scope which allows errors to be propagated to one or more catch clauses. Here is an example of how error handling can be used to respond to different error conditions. In this example, the make a sandwich function will throw an error if no clean dishes are available or if any ingredients are missing. Because make a sandwich can throw an error, the function call is wrapped in a try expression. By wrapping the function call in a do statement, any errors that are thrown will be propagated to the provided catch clauses. If no error is thrown, the eat a sandwich function is called. If an error is thrown and it matches the sandwich error out of clean dishes case, then the wash dishes function will be called. If an error is thrown and it matches sandwich error dot missing ingredients case, then the buy groceries function is called with the associated string value captured by the catch pattern. Throwing, catching, and propagating errors is covered in greater detail in error handling. Assertions and preconditions are checks that happen at runtime. You use them to make sure an essential condition is satisfied before executing any further code. If the Boolean condition in the assertion or precondition evaluates to true, code execution continues as normal. If the condition evaluates to false, the current state of the program is invalid, code execution ends, and your app is terminated. You use assertions and preconditions to express the assumptions you make and the expectations you have while coding, so you can include them as part of your code. Assertions help you find mistakes and incorrect assumptions during development, and preconditions help you detect issues in production. In addition to verifying your expectations at runtime, assertions and preconditions also become a useful form of documentation within the code. Unlike the error conditions discussed in error handling above, assertions and preconditions are not used for recoverable or expected errors. Because a failed assertion or precondition indicates that an invalid program state, there is no way to catch a failed assertion. Using assertions and preconditions is not a substitute for designing your code in such a way that invalid conditions are unlikely to arise. However, using them to enforce valid data and state causes your app to terminate more predictably if an invalid state occurs and helps make the problem easier to debug. Stopping execution as soon as an invalid state is detected also helps limit the damage caused by that invalid state. The difference between assertions and preconditions is in when they are checked. Assertions are checked only in debug builds, but preconditions are checked in both debug and production builds. In production builds, the condition inside an assertion is not evaluated. This means you, you can use as many assertions as you want during your development process without impacting performance in production. Debugging with assertions. You write an assertion by calling the assert file line function from the Swift standard library. You pass this function an expression that evaluates to true or false and a message to display if the result of the condition is false. In this example, code execution continues if age is greater than or equal to zero evaluates to true, that is, if the value of age is non-negative. If the value of age is negative, as in the code above, then age greater than or equal to zero evaluates to false and the assertion fails, terminating the application. You can omit the assertion message, for example, when it would just repeat the condition as prose. If the code already checks the condition, you use the assertion failure function to indicate that an assertion has failed. Enforcing preconditions. Use a precondition whenever a condition has the potential to be false, but must definitely be true for your code to continue execution. For example, 
use a precondition to check that a subscript is not out of bounds or to check that a function has been passed the valid value. You write a precondition by calling the precondition function. You pass this function an expression that evaluates to true or false and a message to display if the result of the condition is false. For example, you can also call the precondition failure function to indicate that a failure has occurred. For example, if the default case of a switch was taken, but all valued input data should have been handled by one of the switch's other cases. Note, if you compile in unchecked mode, preconditions are not checked. The compiler assumes that preconditions are always true and it optimizes your code accordingly. However, the fatal error function always halts execution regardless of optimization settings. You can use the fatal error function during prototyping and early development to create stubs for functionality that have not been implemented yet by writing fatal error unimplemented as the stub implementation. Because fatal errors are never optimized out, unlike assertions or preconditions, you can be sure that execution always halts if it encounters a stub implementation.